Yeah, so I think we'll, we'll get the ball rolling now. So it gives me great pleasure on behalf of the um, UK Prevention Research Partnership Phase Network to introduce this, which is the first in a series of uh, set, uh, webinars we'll be running. All of these are being uh, recorded. Um, so clearly those of you are watching this one live, but we do have um, other ones coming up. So please do register for these, or if you're not able to make them on the day, um, then um, they will be posted on our website later. So coming up um, towards the end of April, we've got one focusing on um, urban development and health, and then we've got later ones focusing on employment, welfare and health, and food advertising and food behaviour. So really excited to have so many great presenters talking about the application of agent-based models to um, public health uh, questions. Going back um, to today, um, in one second, I'll introduce um, the first speaker. We've got two presentations, each of which will last about 20 minutes, and we'll have time for questions after each uh, presentation. Um, if questions occur to you, please do put them in the Q&A, um, and that will enable, enable us to manage them and make sure that all questions are answered. Um, if you want to do some chat in the online chat, um, pl please do so in addition to that, just to um, uh, so there's a bit of interaction between you. But any, any questions that you want addressed um, to each speaker, please pop them in the, the Q&A. OK, so I'll, I'll just shortly hand over to our first speaker, Ross Hammond. We're delighted to have, have Ross uh, joining us all the way from the United States. Uh, the advantage of um, webinar um, format is that we can have international speakers joining us so easily. So many thanks for joining us, uh, Ross. So Ross is from the Brown School um, at the Washington University in St. Louis. Um, Ross has been working for over 20 years um, in applying um, uh, complex systems simulation um, um, methodologies and approaches to a whole range of kind of public health and social science uh, questions. Um, he's he's done he's applied that in in, in many kind of areas um, as well as public health. He's applied applied it to crime, corruption, segregation, trust, and decision making. So a fascinating arena of social and behavioural. Uh, applications to which Ross has uh, usefully and successfully applied agent-based modeling techniques. He's also a senior fellow in economic studies at the Brookings Institution, um, where he is director of the Center on Social Dynamics and, and Policy. And I've had the, the good fortune to see Ross present a couple of times before and know that he's, he's, he's a great speaker. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Ross. I'll stop sharing my, my slides. So Ross, you'll be able to show great. yours. Um, Super. Let me call those up. All right. So we should be up. Can you see those now? That's it. That's perfect. Great. Yeah. Uh, okay. Thanks, Ross. Excellent. Great. Uh, so thank you for inviting me. I'm delighted to speak to this uh, group of people who I understand to contain both uh, other agent-based modelers who are interested in this particular application area and uh, public health professionals and researchers who are interested in this technique as applied to this area. Um, I should say briefly that uh, since this is going to be a talk about tobacco policy, that I do have a variety of formal governmental policy advisory roles, but that nothing that I say in this presentation should be construed to be the official opinion of any of these bodies, only my own thoughts. Um, because this is a group that I think contains some people who have less familiarity with agent-based modeling, I thought I'd just spend a minute or two at the beginning of my talk talking about agent-based modeling, what it is and why are we are using it in uh, population health. For those of you who haven't seen one before, an agent-based model is a computational approach for studying complex social dynamics in which we construct on the computer an artificial society of individual actors who are called agents. These individuals get rules which govern their interaction with each other and with their environment. And the agents are placed in some, some sort of context which governs their interactions, given some starting conditions, and then we simulate from the bottom up how all these decentralized interactions of the individuals generate some population level pattern, like a disease curve or a wealth distribution that we care about. 
Uh, why do we do this? Well, one of the reasons we do this is that we know from lots of studies across many different fields of public health that context really matters in population health. So to give you a concrete example, if you look at the map on the left is showing the density of fast food in New York City area in the United States, and you'll see that this is a very um, uh, sophisticated uh, spatial structure and that were I to do something like break this up into um, residential zip codes and take average density across those zip codes, I would miss important nuances of how this space is actually structured and how people move through it. And almost all our approaches to aggregate away this complexity uh, do disservice to the reality that people who live in this space encounter. Uh, and fortunately, agent-based modeling is really good at capturing spatial realism and heterogeneity across populations. And so this is actually an example from other work that I'm not presenting today, but to give you a sense of the spatial realism that is possible, this is a 3, 3D model of downtown Los Angeles with every building and every road sort of mapped accurately and the movement of people through this space mapped accurately. The second motivation uh, is that we've learned um, in the United States context that what works in one setting may not work without modification in a very different setting. So I'm showing two very different US cities here, San Francisco on the left and Baltimore on the right. And the green color you are seeing is shaded to represent what fraction of, of the population has a low income, less than 35,000 US dollars. Uh, and the red dots are where tobacco retail outlets can be found in real positions in this space. And you'll see that these cities look very different, both in their density of tobacco retail and in their populations. And therefore, you can imagine how a policy that works well for San Francisco may not work well for Baltimore. So we have to learn to tailor our interventions. And the third reason we are motivated to do things like what I will be presenting today, Tobacco Town, is that we often, uh, in a policy context, are confronted with a, a overwhelming array of potential choices. Many different policies we could employ, many different dose strengths of those policies, and many different combinations of different policies that we might consider. And as we saw um, during the pandemic, is what I'm showing here is a pandemic model, uh, that models of this kind can simulate a huge range of policy options and help guide policymakers toward those that are projected to have the maximum impact with the minimum investment. Uh, so this is showing a sort of policy dashboard where you can test different policies shown in gray, blue, and yellow, and their comparative effectiveness in, in this case, containing COVID. But we will see similar examples in tobacco uh, as I continue. And finally, uh, a motivation that really was stressed by a report that the US National Academy of Sciences convened to study the use of agent-based models for tobacco regulation and the potential for that is in tobacco more almost than any other part of public health, we have to think about the long run behavior of our interventions because there are well-organized uh, strategic actors in the tobacco industry who will change what they're doing in response to any change that we make on the policy side and thinking about how that plays out over five years or 10 years, not just over the first year of an intervention is really important. And agent-based models can help us do that. So now I'm gonna talk about a specific agent-based model called Tobacco Town, which is developed to study retail-based tobacco control policy. To give a little context, since I think I'm the only person from the United States here and I, the regulatory system is quite different, in the US, uh, the Food and Drug Administration has regulatory authority over tobacco. There's been lots of experiments with different kinds of tobacco control policies. One of the leading contenders in the current policy environment are spatial density retail policies, so-called point of sale policies that try to reduce availability and prominence of tobacco in the physical environment. Uh, there are lots of reasons why that we can talk about during the Q&A, why this is a preferred way of uh, intervening to uh, reduce tobacco con consumption in the US. Uh, there's lots of experimentation underway by states and large cities in the US, but no general theory about what exactly these interventions will do and which combination of interventions works best and for whom. Uh, so that is what Tobacco Town is trying to solve. The idea of reducing density uh, of tobacco sales is not only to decrease availability and increase cost, which are fairly straightforward, but also to decrease visibility of environmental cues to smoke, to change social norms, <clears throat> and to reduce this very high density that we call tobacco swamps. I think policymakers come into this 
assuming that the world looks something like this, in which as we reduce density of tobacco retailers on the x-axis from high at the left to low on the right, we will increase cost uh, to obtain tobacco on the part of smokers from low or potential smokers from low to high like this linearly. But if we do a quick thought experiment, uh, we'll see why this might not be the case. So imagine this little 10 year old girl who lives here in this house and she has to walk down Main Street on her way to school. And as she does so, she passes all, all six of these tobacco retailers. Now imagine we, we impose a policy which would be seen as a very strong heavy handed policy in the US context. And we just force two thirds of the tobacco retailers to close overnight. Um, if we did that, you can see why it actually wouldn't make much difference to this little girl because there's two more on the very next block. Therefore, this suggests that the structure uh, of, the, of the environment will determine which policies work and how they work, but also that the relationship between density and cost might be nonlinear as shown here. Uh, so Tobacco Town was designed to serve as a policy laboratory uh, in which you can compare tactics like zoning, licensing rules, uh, buffer zones, which are shown in this depiction on the right hand, you see circles drawn around the little green, uh, little blue schools. Uh, and a real policy that's under consideration in lots of parts of the United States is to draw buffer zones of say a thousand meters around schools and remove all tobacco retail sales and advertising in that environment. So Tobacco Town allows you to consider many different possible intervention styles and do that in a context that can be much more realistic uh, and in many cases uh, that has, has not been studied empirically. So modeling is going to give us an answer uh, that will allow us to move forward. We built up Tobacco Town over many years. There's a whole series of papers and the early versions of Tobacco Town work something like this. So you are looking as if you're in a helicopter from the top down at a dense urban core at rush hour. The orange dots are individual actors, agents who are moving around this environment on the street grid. The squares are tobacco retailers. They flash yellow when someone makes a purchase there. There are different uh, colors and sizes to reflect different kinds of tobacco retail, convenience stores, gas stations, uh, grocery stores, et cetera. And they have different product mixes and prices. Uh, and then what we do in Tobacco Town, that was a single commuting morning, is we then manipulate this retail environment to represent different policy interventions and re-simulate and see how the world has changed from the perspective of individual tobacco consumers. In the early versions of Tobacco Town, we have idealized uh, representations of space like I just showed you. Um, they differ from each other based on income and, uh, and density, urban versus suburban. Uh, we have agents who move through this space who are different from each other in how much they smoke, in how they move around this space uh, on foot, by bike, or by car. Uh, and, and then what we do is we simulate um, where they choose to buy tobacco, how much they pay for that tobacco, and how uh, far out of their way do they have to go to get the tobacco that they're trying to purchase. Uh, there's a whole complicated way in which we calculate uh, the behavior of the individual agents, which I'm not going to go through given the brevity of this talk, but I'm happy to talk through in, in some detail later uh, for anyone who's interested, but it's also in our papers. And this is what the world looks like to an individual in Tobacco Town. So here's an idealized space with different kinds of stores uh, that you can see here, tobacconists and grocery stores and so on. And here's an actual person who we're going to follow through this space. This is a person who, who commutes by car, who has an income shown here, a race shown here, um, uh, different behaviors that are shown here on the right, uh, who keeps track of how much tobacco they have and when they're running out and when they need to buy it, and who makes decisions about uh, which of these uh, types of stores they will shop at and what the cost they will pay will be. <clears throat> this early version of Tobacco Town found, uh, even with these idealized communities, found some really interesting policy salient lessons. The three that I want to quickly review is first, there does appear to be a very nonlinear relationship as our thought experiment suggested, um, in, which means that retail density reduction works better when you are starting with less density. And if you have a very high density, you may have to do quite a lot of policy work to bring it down into a range where it will start to make a real difference in behavior. The second is that the right policy choice and mixture actually depends very much on what kind of setting you are going to operate into this uh, this tailoring idea that I referred to earlier. And the third, which is more hopeful, I think, from a policy perspective, is that we find that layering low 
low doses of different policies can have a super additive effect um, in which they're interacting with each other and providing synergy so that a few light touch policies might work better than one very heavy handed policy. We applied this early version of Tobacco Town in several real policy settings, including in New York City and in the state of Minnesota in the United States. And we developed these kinds of policy dashboards, which you can actually find on our website, that show how you can dial in on the left different policy choices and different settings. And on the right, these screens will redraw to show, to show how retail density changes as a result of any one of these policies and setting mixtures that you can pick. We are now working on and are about to be ready to publish some results from uh, what we're calling Tobacco Town 2.0, which is a big upgrade in a variety of ways that I will briefly describe. Um, the first of these is that we've added a lot of product differentiation. Uh, so in the original version of Tobacco Town, tobacco, everything was a cigarette and all the cigarettes were the same. Now we have things like menthol cigarettes, different uh, forms in which tobacco is sold. We have added to the model, not just uh, an endpoint, which is what is the price and inconvenience paid by smokers to obtain tobacco, but gone further and looked at actual projected cessation rates, reduction in smoking um, due to these policies, as well as in uh, making our retailers uh, adaptive so that they change what they're doing. If you close some of them, the others will not keep behaving the same way as they did before the closure of their competitors. That's now taken into account in these models. Uh, we've moved to much more accurate geography and demography. So the version I early version I showed you uses this idealized grid form for the geography uh, and uses these idealized demographic constructs like a wealthy urban place and a poor suburban place. What we have now is we actually are using something that in my other work I had a lot of involvement with uh, in infectious disease. These are what are called synthetic populations, which were developed uh, by a huge investment from the federal government in the US specifically for agent-based models of infectious disease, but they're also quite good for agent-based models of other things like tobacco control. So what you are looking at here is what's called a synthetic population. Uh, this happens to be uh, St. Louis City that I've shown here. This is a satellite picture. Each of these tiny little pixels that you can barely see is an individual person. Uh, here they happen to be shaded by age, but each person in the synthetic population comes with an income, a home location, a work location, a mode of transport, um, lots of social context information, an occupation, um, all this kind of very rich detailed information about spatial engagement. And this is all based on real data, but it's stitched together from many different real data sources in a way that um, abstracts away enough from reality um, to, uh, to address privacy concerns while remaining the statistical flavor of the real underlying data. Um, these are actually available for every place in the United States. So that has enabled us to actually have a very high degree of population spatial realism, where people live and where they work, where they go to school and how they move through space. Uh, and we couple that with real empirical data on where specific tobacco retailers actually are. So here's San Francisco I'm picking on again here, and you can see all the red dots that are at actual intersections and addresses. Uh, we know for each of these retailers what the price points are and what the product mixture is and so on. So we're combining GIS-based uh, tobacco data with uh, these synthetic populations to make a very uh, realistic and geographically specific uh, rendition of Tobacco Town for each place that we apply it. And then finally, we are, are currently engaged with policymakers in the largest 30 cities across the US to simulate custom mixes of priority policies. So what is of high interest to San Francisco may be uh, different than what's of high interest to Baltimore. Uh, and we're simulating a, a, a variety of, of mixes of policies for each of these cities as they think through what their next steps might be uh, to enact tobacco regulations. And we're doing this as part of a broader project that's funded uh, very generously by the National Institutes of Health in the US. Um, that's a, uh, a center that's combining um, data collection abilities about smokers and tobacco with this kind of modeling um, that, we, that we've been showing you here. Uh, in the last couple minutes that I have uh, before I stop for uh, questions, I just wanna quickly say this kind of work uh, is very challenging. Getting the right kind of data can be challenging as you'd imagine. Uh, the dialogue with policy, which I've described as, uh, 
is very successful, certainly can be, but needs a lot of careful um, hand handling and management and planning to go well. Uh, there's an, a dearth of training um, in the US at least in agent-based modeling and how to do policy-oriented agent-based modeling, which I think is quite different from many other uses of agent-based modeling. And to build the right kinds of teams can be challenging. Um, I'll leave you with a nice quote from the National Academy of Sciences in the US arguing that not only should everyone in academia learn uh, this kind of modeling, but the private sector and government agencies as well. So thank you very much. And I will stop sharing so that I can see everyone's faces and um, we can do questions. That's great. Thanks ever so much, uh, Ross, and you kept brilliantly. So I think we have uh, eight minutes for, for any questions or discussion? Uh, Lawrence, you seem to have frozen. I'm not yeah, sure. I, just I think me. we've just lost Lawrence for a minute there. So um, yeah, I can see the Q and A. So if anyone wants to post any questions there, um, while we're waiting for Lawrence to come back, or for um, uh, questions in Q and I had a quick question. So do you sure. make some quite realistic um models in terms of basing it on the geography and the populations that are seen in mm -hmm. the US cities. Um, is there any evidence from where policies have been implemented in any of these cities where you can compare it to the model data that you've already got and see how they're how realistic yes, that is versus what's actually happening in those cities? Yeah, so that that is starting to be possible. A lot of the motivation to do this modeling is because a lot of the policy ideas that are out there have not been systematically tested in any real places and certainly not in enough places that you can do that kind of empirical comparison. So model-based projections are what are often being invoked to guide policy choices. That said, the places where there have been uh, policy experiences that we can reproduce in our model, that's certainly an approach we could use uh, and are using to test our models sort of uh, explanatory power retrospectively. And that's one of many strategies that we use to sort of test and build confidence in these models. I'm happy to talk about others as well. Yeah, thank you. And then um, I see there's a couple of questions coming up in the Q&A now. So um, someone says, great presentation. Um, and they asked about how are you implementing the interaction of the different tobacco products and things within the um, models? Yeah. So in this particular model, uh, the way that we do that is uh, when there's multiple different product types, each individual smoker has a preference surface, a substitution surface over those different product mixtures that they prefer. Um, and some rate at which they're willing to trade off, say, price for the kind of product that they prefer. And those are actually based on empirical, empirical data. Uh, and then when products availability starts to change, so in the US, one of the policies we've simulated is a menthol ban, for example. What that menthol ban means to individual smokers differs. For some of them, it means they're more likely to just quit. For others, they'll substitute a different kind of tobacco, um, but maybe at a different price uh, sensitivity than, than before. And so all, all that's uh, that's handled. We don't model um, the biolog biological effects of tobacco in the body. So in that sense, we're not modeling sort of an addiction process in any detail or some biochemical interaction between this kind of smoking and that kind of smoking. That's outside the scope of this particular model. Yeah, okay, great, thank you. Um, and then there's another question uh, in the chat and the Q&A from Rick um, asking about whether you've got um, any plans to add social networks into the models. Yeah, so I think the next speaker is going to talk a lot about social networks, which I'm happy about. Um, at the beginning of the Tobacco Town project, we thought we were going to set out to build a model that was about smoking initiation um, and underage smoking, both of which I think there's strong evidence have a social network component. This particular model is about how people buy tobacco at physical retailers where they have to be of age to do so. And I have not seen a lot of evidence that social influence is part of how people make those decisions. So therefore those are those social networks are not in this model right now. It's emphasized the strength of agent-based modeling and capturing the geography. Uh, but uh, the only kind of social influence that's really in here right now is indirect through the marketplace, essentially in terms of the behavior of the retailers uh, on each other and so on. We are not explicitly representing social networks right now. Yeah, okay, brilliant. Yes, and like you said, hopefully um, Valeria's gonna cover a little bit more about how social networks kind of interact in this sort of environment. 
Um, <laughs> Lawrence, I see you're back, so I'll oh, hand sorry, back over yeah. to you for sharing. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, that was great timing. My my internet crashed just at the wrong time. Um, so I've obviously missed what you've discussed. I mean, the quest question I had was just whether you could say a little bit more about your interaction with policymakers. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, you, you talked about the New York example and, and, and your continuing interaction with the work you're planning. But just mm -hmm. to say a little bit more about that and maybe any specific examples of where your work, either the abstract grid based work or now you're applying it to real kind of more real world data has has influence in policy decisions. Sure. Yeah. So agent based model, a lot of my work across many topic domains, including this one, um, is policy oriented. And uh, there's a pretty good track record, I think, of agent based modeling um, being a useful tool, a decision support tool for policymakers. Um, there's, uh, I think, lots of um, subtleties that one has to defend against in using models in this way, um, but they can be very successful. Uh, and indeed, lots of, uh, of real world policies are based on agent based modeling results um, that we can we can discuss in more detail if time permits. Um, in this case, in Tobacco Town in particular, we did have a successful engagement with New York City, who was considering various um, changes to tobacco policy that we were able to simulate for them. And those uh, those simulations and, uh, went on to be one of the inputs into their their final decision making process. And we did similar work with the state of Minnesota that I, I talked about. We are now engaging with policymakers who are part of a stakeholder group Group that come from these 30 largest cities in the US. Um, th that is not published or public yet, so I can't talk about how those interactions are going in great detail on this webinar since we're recording it. Um, but uh, stay tuned, and I think you'll see some, some interesting results coming out of that project over this next year. Well, that's great. So some specific impact and then some continuing mm -hmm. traction then with, with decision makers. That, that's good. Yes. And again, in the, in the absence of any anything else in the Q&A. My, my other question, which is a bit naive because I'm, I'm, I'm very keen to champion um, the use of ABMs in population health, but I'm not a modeler my, myself. Um, but I was wondering to what extent is the work you've shown us um, a spatial micro simulation? I mean, and would an agent-based model allow you to take the work a bit further by it, 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 I mean, I'm not sure exactly how it would work in this in this context, but I can I can see that you you might then actually be able to model how as agents change their behaviour in response to a change in the environment through one mm -hmm. of these policies you're modelling, that that then might lead to a further environmental change. So, for example, if 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 a policy led to so many tobacco retailers being closed, it might then lead to one particular part of the town being one where there was just one retailer doing really, really well, and it might mm -hmm. then lead to a kind of change. So that so, so, so those, those things in are, terms are of, actually is. yeah. So in those, terms of this specific example, but also in terms of your general work, say a little bit more about that ability to look at the interaction between agent behavior and and, and, and the more, more macro environmental system state type behaviors and the extent to which you've done that already and how that might be something to bring in in the future. Sure. So in Tobacco Town, the kind of uh, sequence, dynamic sequence you describe is already in there. We are, we are already doing that. So there we are considering that sort of long term adaptation pathway um, and the agents do uh, have influence uh, on each other indirectly through the environment and through the retailers. And so I think um, a common distinction between what, what some people are calling micro simulation and what some people are calling true agent based modeling is whether the agents interact. But I think you'll find in the broader literature uh, that's in economics that uh, interacting through the market is one way in which agents can interact. They don't necessarily have to actually have social networks or social influence or talk to each other to have uh, influence and interaction with each other. And that sort of more market style agent based model is what we're doing here. Great. And I, th I think one final question because of time, but we have got a couple of questions in the Q&A. So the, the, I think a really important question. So thank you, Ardash, is, is the question they've said, do you think assuming rational agents in such models for policy is a reasonable assumption? And I suppose me as chair Good adding question. to that, I mean, the extent to which what you're finding in these models, which is based on this assumption of rationality, as well as the constraints of how, how much have you been able to kind of validate that what you're sort of showing is occurring is, 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 is replicating what's happening in real life? 
Yeah, so I glossed over that very quickly, and that's a really good question. In the um, one of the early versions of Tobacco Town, which is is actually uh, the focus of one of the papers that I put up briefly, the one that's in Health in Place, does explore multiple different styles of agent learning and behavior. And so we actually look at three distinct rules there, the rational rule that we're using that I, I highlighted here, but also a, a complete other end of the spectrum is a purely myopic learning rule in which agents start with no information about their environment and sample retailers with bias toward those that are closest to them uh, and even can, can learn about retailers from others in some cases. And then an uh, intermediate rule, which we actually think may be the, mo the most realistic in which uh, it's called a two-phase rule it's based on evidence from marketing science in which people use heuristic filters to eliminate most of the choices uh, up front and then optimize in the remaining much reduced choice set. And I'm happy to talk more about those. Uh, we did test the, the how all of those change the behavior of the agents and we compared not just the main output, but the sort of all along the way outputs like the distribution of sales volume across the retailers per day, which we have real data on, and the mixture of prices paid by individuals, which we have real data on to see which how uh, these different decision rules map onto outcomes we can measure and therefore which might be the best one to proceed with. Now that we have a more spatially sophisticated model, we are redoing that kind of exploration of different decision rules. So the final policy version for these 30 largest cities will uh, almost certainly not just contain the simple rational rule that I described, but probably an update of that. But I don't can't say exactly what that will look like yet. Yeah, great. Thanks, Ross. That's great. And if you're, we might have some a chance to ask you some more questions after sure. Valerio's presentation. Absolutely. We're going to move on now. So, Valerio, we'd like to begin to share your screen. And for, actually, whilst Valerio is doing that, Ross, there is one other question. Sure. What platform mm -hmm. are you developing 2.0 in? You can probably answer that really quickly Python. whilst Valerio is loading up. Sorry? Python. Python. Great. Thanks. So, Valerio, are you able to share your slides? Share your screen? Yeah. Is everything working okay? Yeah, we can see that and we can hear you, so that's great. Green, right, fantastic. <clears throat> All right, so, uh, well, thank so, you yeah, for- Just to introduce you, so apologies. Uh, Valeria, so very pleased that Valeria is able to present the second of the uh, examples of uh, applying ABMs to, to, to tobacco issues. Valeria is joining us from the University um, of Edinburgh. Um, where he's based in the Edinburgh uh, University School of Informatics um, and he particularly works on business applications uh, of informatics um, and we've, um, we're have we very delighted to have you uh, join us um, for this um, talk on, in for public health and tobacco. So thanks Valeria, over to you. Um, yeah, so before I start actually I would like to thank Ross for explaining agent-based modeling so well. I don't think I could have done such a such a good job and I don't have to because he's done it for me. So, uh, well, for the both of us. So uh, instead, I would like to, uh, to, to start, uh, now that we all know what agent-based models are, I would, like, I would like to start with a story. So um, to start with the story, I will show you this picture. So uh, this is me when I was 23 years old. And I'm not just showing it to you just because I had more hair and that makes me somewhat proud but also because this was actually uh, one of my first cigarettes and in fact this is the first and one of the very few uh, pictures that the Ralph may smoking because a friend of mine was so shocked to see me smoking um, because I just recently started that she decided to take a picture of me um, so 23 years old uh, so I started late uh, compared to most people and uh, for that reason, basically, uh, all my friends and family were uh, either scolding me or making fun of me um, because, you know, like I was already, I was not a kid anymore, so I should have known better. Although, although like most of them were smokers themselves. But uh, I think that's what happened that they, I didn't know back then. What they didn't know also is that it was basically... Uh, Doom, I was doomed to become a smoker and the reason is that when growing up both my parents were smokers uh, then going to school through middle school and high school uh, some friends started to smoke uh, some of my family were smokers as well uh, went to university um, because I like to take breaks outside basically I became friends with mostly smokers so then at some point um, quite a lot of my uh, social contacts were smokers themselves 
And that, of course, like uh, it went on and on until I became a smoker myself. So why is that important? So it is important because um, social contagion uh, empirically has been shown to be uh, one of the uh, main drivers of both initiation and cessation in smoking. And especially for initiation, and especially in uh, adolescents, which represent, I think, around 99% of people, uh, well, so 99% of uh, smokers start um, in their teens. So it, it's very important to study social contagion, but um, there aren't many models that do that in a, in a very accurate way. So most social contagion models for tobacco, for instance, assume that people are all connected to each other and therefore they can all influence each other. And they do so through uh, differential equation models. And we know that this is not the case, of course. But also because before uh, starting to work uh, a couple of years ago in, uh, on tobacco, uh, I used to work on uh, um, the social contagion models for uh, other applications, uh, opinion dynamics, misinformation, uh, finance, counterterrorism, you name it. But um, in these applications, in these topics, uh, social contagion models are uh, more advanced. So in most cases, people use agent-based models because they have all the disadvantages that uh, Ross mentioned earlier. But in tobacco, what I've seen was that social contagion is still modeled through simple equations that cannot capture the complexity of the phenomenon. So these models are, in the end, not true and not that useful. I understand that basically no model is actually entirely correct, but some are useful. In this case, so, uh, differential equations are not really. And the reason is that they're not really that useful for uh, um, devising uh, strategies to um, for tobacco control, but also like to really understand and quantify the trends in social contagion for tobacco. So the solution to me was to do what I've done in uh, in other areas. So to use agent-based models on networks and model social contagion in this way. So um, to do that, I partnered with uh, one of my colleagues and one of my PhD students, and we started to explore ways to do that. So we decided in the end to um, develop a model that had these two components. So one is social contagion through social networks, and the other one uh, is just spontaneous terms. So this is to um, represent the impact that, for instance, the government might have, or you know, like common sense might have in both. Uh, well, quitting, but also um, tobacco manufacturers can have and re retailers can have in uh, um, taking up smoking. So we had a mix of these um, different uh, types of uh, behavior that could influence somebody to start smoking, quit smoking, relapse after the quit. And so we um, decided to then calibrate these on uh, um, data from the Framingham Heart Study because of course we ended up having like some uh, quite a few parameters in the model so we wanted to get data from uh, real world experiments so one of the very few longitudinal experiments on uh, on uh, tobacco consumption and social contagion in tobacco is this study so we decided to calibrate some of the parameters on that and then to calibrate the rest of the parameters, we ran literally millions of simulations on uh, UK and US data of um, prevalence of smokers and quitters and never smokers and calibrated our model as a result. So we then validated our model uh, on the last 10 years of prevalence data for both countries and we found actually in both cases very similar results. So some of our key findings were that well, not surprisingly, differential equation models do not reproduce empirical data adequately. Uh, in that, of course, uh, differential equation models can be reproduced by um, our model as well, uh, just by assuming that everybody is connected to everybody. And these were giving like, uh, results which were way off the real data that we could uh, see. But the other uh, finding that I think is way more interesting, although it doesn't sound like much, is that we found that the network topology, so the structure of the network, meaning the distribution of friends and close contacts that we have, 
does not matter that much. What matters is the uh, number of close contacts that we have in the model for each agent. So the average number. So this actually has some implications because, um, so then again, coming from um, social contagion in various topics, work, having worked on that for a long time, one of the main issues is that the uh, network topology does affect uh, contagion quite significantly. But for real world applications, it's very rare that you can actually access the social network. So for instance, in this case, if you wanted to have the social network of, uh, say, a whole town to then explore um, the, the model and potential strategies, we couldn't do that. So to find that synthetic networks uh, can be generated and they can still give good results in terms of, well, credibility of the model and the social contagion, uh, at least in the social contagion aspect, that's quite important. So specifically, we found that to get good results, we needed agents to have on average three close contacts. Close contacts are defined as in uh, those people who can actually influence you in either starting or quitting or relapsing even. So more than that, and the results started to be uh, far away from uh, the, uh, the, the, the empirical data. So as I said, in the real world, we don't know the exact network topology. So we cannot just like, go around and ask uh, all the population to give us their close context. Um, so that's uh, quite useful, actually, from a policy uh, point of view, especially. Which brings me to um, the, the next uh, piece of work that I want to talk about. So uh, this is something that we have not published yet. Um, but we're running now the, the, the simulations, with the, we're finalizing simulations for this. And this is based on the previous model that I, I just described. So we used that model to develop um, simple cost-effective strategies that can increase the number of people who stop smoking. So the idea was that, okay, so now we, uh, we have a model that accurately describes social contagion. How do we use that to uh, develop strategies and interventions. So we wanted something that could be used in real life. So uh, we didn't want something extremely complicated or based on unrealistic assumptions. So we wanted something that could be simple and actionable. We wanted uh, strategies that would work even without knowing the network topology or uh, many other characteristics of the populations and how they interact. And also that um, strategies that must not require extra resources from the government. So uh, we tested uh, quite a few of them and we found that the friendship paradox was actually a very simple and effective um, strategy. So the friendship paradox is something known in, uh, in network science and, well, in short, it's basically the property by which your friends, on average, have more friends than you. Uh, which sounds depressing, but it's just a property of the fact that, for instance, if we um, if we have a look at this figure here on the right, we choose a random node there, and then we pick uh, a node among these the first node's contacts. Then, unless we pick the blue one, in all other cases, the the second one that we go to, so basically the the contact of the first choice, will have more friends, more contacts, and these are results of uh, networks have, having uh, um, basically these sort of like heterogeneous uh, distribution of uh, contacts, right? So just statistically, if we pick somebody at random, we pick one of their friends, uh, we're picking the second friend more likely because they have more friends themselves. So just by, by just applying something this simple, in a very simple way, uh, we can actually get some strategy that has an impact for cessation. So, for instance, assume that a uh, smoker cessation clinic has resources to help 100 smokers. So, instead of accepting uh, and treating 100 random people, then we can just accept the first 50. Then we ask each of these 50 people to also bring in a contact who's a smoker. So, we end up treating 100 people in total, but we just need to recruit the first 50 and just we, we then just ask them to bring in a friend or a spouse or a member of the, their family who also smokes. 
by doing that, we saw that by targeting 10% of the total population, just by using this very simple rule, cessation has increased by at least 6% in our model after, uh, after five years. And I know that it doesn't sound much, but at the same time, if you think about it, so without increasing resources, with a strategy which is very easy to implement, we can get 6% or more, more people uh, quitting. And this is especially true because um, marginal gains go beyond 6% if less people are targeted. So I gave you the example when we target 10% of the population, but we, if we target 1% of the population, the difference between this, our strategy and um, the, the baseline becomes much higher. And of course, the, the other way uh, is also true that if we target more um, a higher fraction of the population, of course, the, the marginal gains um, will get lower. But at the same time, um, we are trying now to run it for uh, um, communities with a high prevalence of smokers. And uh, because communities with high prevalence of smokers tend to be also communities with a higher deprivation, this will um, very likely result, uh, hopefully, in, a, in, in an effective strategy to reduce inequalities as well. Then the last bit that I wanted to talk about is the um, project that we've been working on in the last few months, thanks to uh, FaZe, and focuses specifically of, on social contagion in adolescents. So the, the goal of the project here was to um, test policies to reduce, to reduce initiation among adolescents, but also at the same time assessing the impact of these policies on long-term inequalities. So um, we modeled different types of neighborhoods based on different deprivation scores uh, from Scotland uh, using uh, uh, as backbone tobacco town. But we, we changed the agent, so we keep the structure of the town, we changed the agent significantly so that we can uh, have adolescents uh, interacting in a more detailed way. And adolescents in our model follow this path, so they are non-smokers, they might become experimenters based on uh, um, whether their peers smoke or not. And finally, they can become smokers or actually, well, casual smokers, but we don't make a distinction yet when they start buying, actively buying um, cigarettes by themselves. So uh, we are currently uh, testing a number of policies around uh, retailer availability, so very similar to what uh, Ross described. Um, but also policies on price, uh, age restrictions, and places. So, simulations are currently running, so unfortunately I don't have any uh, concrete results uh, to show you about this. But um, we're also working with Public Health Scotland and um, soon, very likely, the Scottish Government as well, so to uh, get feedback on which interventions might be um, of interest for them and to implement to implement those and to test them and um, finally also um, we're using social contagion just not because we, we think that uh, that makes a lot of sense but uh, also because thanks to social contagion we can actually get insights on both the short-term and the long-term impact of these policies because social contagion is something that um, happens and takes place over a number of years in most cases so we want to see that as well so this is me thank you very much happy to answer any question okay thank you valeria we'd like to stop sharing your screen so we can um see everyone or see each other thank you great um so just briefly, so for me, I would just, I would just, if, if you could sort of say a little bit more, I, I didn't quite follow you when you were sort of saying, with your example of choosing the fifty and then asking those fifty to to identify a friend of theirs who was a smoker. What's the mechanism that leads that to be more effective? Is it simply that that your the the people you're targeting? Are, are being referred and therefore they're, they're, they're smokers or is it is it or is it somehow because the two you know you've got a pair of smokers and if if one of them if they both give up together then they provide them each other with some support so the, the likelihood of 
of quitting is increased because of the kind of social support within that that dyad. Um, just say a little bit more about that mechanism. Yes, there are two mechanisms at play. So one is the one that you were just describing. So by choosing two people who are already in contact, you minimize the chances that uh, either of them relapses. But also at the same time, um, you minimize the, the chances that they, uh, well, say like infect one of their contacts. Uh, so basically you're creating this sort of uh, equivalent of an echo chamber where people do not relapse into smoking or they don't start smoking. So you create this sort of like um, very densely connected uh, communities of non-smokers by doing that. Um, and the second reason is that uh, thanks to the friendship uh, paradox, actually the second person that comes in tends to have a higher degree of uh, social contacts. So it tends to be more influential than the first one. And this is purely a mathematical property of networks. So basically by targeting in this way, you are exploiting both things. So you, one is the, all the reinforcement process uh, and the other one is just you're targeting somebody who's on average more influential. Right, so it's through the cessation of, that, of, of the pair, but particularly of the, the second person who will then informally influence a wide number of people to perhaps also be more likely to to, to quit smoking so they don't necessarily yeah 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 the, the main thing is of course that the main contribution comes from the fact that uh, it is a pair right yeah oh, it's really great like this sort of network effects but uh, at the same time of course it is beneficial uh to some extent having somebody who can influence more people. great thanks so i think we've got a, a question from hussein which is good which i think i might um ask both of you, um, both Ross and Valerio. So maybe Valerio first as you're in the hot seat. Um, uh, so the question is, 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 you know, how likely is that the same kind of thinking could be transferred to other health problems? Um, I don't know if Valerio, if you'd like to respond to that first, and I'm sure Ross will have a follow up to, to that question as well. Yeah, sure. Of course, we, th we, we thought about that. And I believe uh, it might just be a matter of uh, um, recalibrating the model on a different, uh, well, different data. Uh, I think the model in itself is quite flexible. So it just assumes that people, you know, start to quit based on social interactions. And uh, um, as I said, like the spontaneous term, so it's just a matter of recalibration. I don't think the, the um, the type of social contagion will differ that much. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and Ross, I mean, have you, have you, yeah. you, obviously we've asked you to talk today about um, tobacco town and, and applications mm -hmm. to tobacco, but I'm, I'm guessing that you've probably used some very similar approaches for, for other health behaviors. Sure. So yeah, I, I use agent-based modeling a lot in the um, obesity space and uh, diabetes space uh, as well. Um, and in a couple other uh, areas of public health, I think the tobacco town specific approach is really very focused on the retail environment and on retail density, because that's where the policy action is in the US regulatory context right now for tobacco. I think you could model other things where retail density is important that way. So fast food is something that I showed a map of retail density of. We could do a similar kind of story there. Uh, I, it's less clear that that is a policy lever of high interest for uh, regulators in the US for food right now. So I'm not sure that that I mean, uh, model would be as closely targeted to the policy uh, environment. In general, I think um, the overall approach of using a spatially realistic simulation model to think about policies is a very um, fecund one that can apply all over the place, but the specifics of any given model are really often uh, should be tightly tailored to the policy questions they were designed to answer. And if you stray too far from those, I saw some questions in the chat about e-cigarettes, for example, and one of the reasons e-cigarettes are not currently in Tobacco Town is that a lot of e-cigarette sales in the U.S. are online, um, and that is not something that can be part of Tobacco Town easily because it's very focused on spatial aspects. So it would require a somewhat different model, which we could certainly do, but. Right, well, that's interesting. So I think in the UK, the density of, um, of both fast food and e-cigarette vaping stores is, is quite a big policy issue mm -hmm. at, at the moment. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, that's cool. interesting. Great. Um, another question we've got in the Q&A from, from Rick, um, 
I guess this is this is following up with, with you, Ross, maybe a little bit more, is you you talked about um synthetic populations or so I'm just would you like to say a little bit more about that process? Because I'm not sure, you know, how, is that kind of applying you know, bringing together kind of census data, so some population data with maybe some survey data, and you're somehow kind of then applying the survey estimates to the whole population, so you know where the population is, but you can then apply the sample characteristics from from a from a survey to them. Is that the kind of process you're going through there? That's the kind of process. Just to be clear, I didn't build the synthetic populations. The U.S. government um, spent a very large amount of money building them over about a decade. Um, during the height of the previous pandemic era and the H1N1 flu era is what they were originally built for, for infectious disease model, agent-based models, but they're freely available and we've been able to leverage them for, for Tobacco Town and for other things that we're doing. Um, and I did see a question in there about, could you, could you infer social structure, uh, social networks or social contacts from uh, the synthetic populations? And I think it's my answer would be sort of yes and no, and I'll say what I mean in a second, but I want to make sure we also hear Valerio's answer to that. From my experience working with them, um, the kind of social information that you can fairly straightforwardly get from the synthetic populations is uh, who has contact, physical proximity to someone else, because that's actually what they were designed for, is the spread of a respiratory disease that requires physical proximity. So they're quite good at capturing sort of who's in school with someone else, or who works in the same workplace as someone else, um, those kinds of things. It's less clear that that's the right kind of network for social influence, um, which may have very little to do with physical proximity, um, especially recently. Um, and I, I think you would have to supplement it with, you know, different data source to do that effectively. Yeah, great. Thanks. And we'll have to wrap up soon. But just moving okay. to you, Valerio. I mean, following on from that point from uh, Ross. I mean. Do you feel there's a strong case and would, would your work be really improved if we had better data on social networks, both, you know, physical friendship networks, but also other other relationships of influence, which obviously might increasingly be online because there's we're having to make quite strong assumptions of it. So we're, we're both I mean, both presentations, but particularly yours shows the importance of these social contagion effects and of social influence, doesn't it? But we, we still have got very limited data on what networks really look like and, and where where the where the key influences are. So do, do we need should we make be, be make a strong case to the ESRC or whoever to to fund you know this network data collection for large samples or subpopulations? So uh, I guess we don't have time to discuss the ethical implications of that. So we'll just go to the technical answer. So um, of course, like that would. Uh, would improve this type of research quite a lot because then you can, you know, come up with uh, better models, better strategies, uh, more detailed strategies as well that you, you cannot do right now, right? So uh, right now we cannot do that. So and that was pretty much the motivation of my uh, of the the first model that I presented there. So we wanted to see whether just by using synthetic networks we could replicate to some degree of uh, realism the uh, the empirical data. So we can, but of course it's not optimal right in, in other um in other contexts actually uh, they have tried uh, at a very small scale so we're talking about probably a thousand people or so uh, to actually collect the data uh, for, for a social network and to test these interventions very different type of um, applications of course but and that obviously gives like much much better results but then you know there is all the issue of uh, should we Collect this type of data. <laughs> yeah, and in, in many cases, the data already exists. It's just held in the private sector, not available to researchers. Yes. Yeah, that's right. There's a lot. There's they've got huge, huge uh, relational data sets, haven't they? Some of these online companies, etc. Well, we should wrap up there. I would very much like to thank both both of you. It's been great presentations. It's really great to have seen two uh, examples of these um, social simulation approaches being used so effectively for, for really understanding and influencing um, sort of policymakers um, around critical um, 
policy decisions around tobacco. So it's it, it's great to see these new methods being applied to important um, questions that are having impact. So thank you very much um, to, to both uh, Ross and Valerio, and thank you to all the attendees and for your questions. And do tune in on the 24th of April for our, our next uh, ABM webinar. 